Welcome to Nous, the podcast where we tackle the deepest questions about the mind. My guest in this episode is a philosopher who defends a theory of consciousness which has, on the one hand, been dismissed as the silliest claim ever made. In the New York Times, no less. But it's also a theory with some extremely eminent proponents, including the great Daniel Dennett. And his work encompasses much else besides, including topics in psychology, AI and cognitive science. He's got affiliations with The Open University, Sheffield University and the University of Crete. And it's from Crete where he now joins me. Dr. Keith Frankish, welcome to Naus. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, I want to start with a very broad question. On your website, you have a, a list of humorous definitions. <laughs> you call them dyspeptic definitions. Uh, and the entry for a philosopher is an expert in everything and nothing. <laughs> now, with, with that in mind, I, I want to ask you, what's the relationship of your philosophical work with the empirical disciplines, with neuroscience and cognitive science? Now, in the intro, I, I mentioned that uh, you your work encompasses cognitive science, AI. You've, you've edited Cambridge handbooks, which cover those topics. Where do you think your philosophical work stands in relation to empirical disciplines of science? Oh, that's an excellent question uh, and a tough one. Um, the point of the of the little um, of, the, of the dyspeptic definition was that I mean all of those aim to have a certain amount of truth in them, and I'll try and explain what I think the truth in that one is. It was Wilfred Sellers, mid twentieth century philosopher, who said that philosophy is about thinking about how things, in the broadest sense of the term, hang together, in the broadest sense of the term, of the broadest sense of the term. So it's about looking at a bunch of stuff and trying to sort of get it all in proportion and in relation to each other and see how stuff fits together. That's why it's not about doing very detailed, specific work, empirical work. It's about, as I see it, it's about looking at empirical work, looking at specialist work and seeing how it fits together with specialist work in other areas. So it's about trying to see the big picture, trying to paint the big picture. So it's synthesizing from the sciences, but also what, what's the sort of additional element that the philosophy brings? Or is it just that synthesizing exercise? Yes, it is trying to see the big picture, trying to get things in proportion, trying to see where the idea is that things do hang together. So if something doesn't seem to hang together with the rest of the picture, then, well, we need to do one of two things. We either need to modify the bigger picture or modify our view of that particular bit that's not fitting in. And of course, I suppose the the default approach would be to look at that specific thing that seems recalcitrant. And that's relevant to what I think about consciousness. Yes, absolutely. That sets us up nicely. You, you, you've just made me, I, I'm, I'm really fond of that quote from, uh, from Wilfred Sellers. I think I've quoted it myself, actually, in a blog when I was writing about the podcast. I, it, you've, just, you've just made me think about the fact that, that it assumes that things will hang together, <laughs> which is, of course, in itself, a, perhaps a, a big question, um, isn't it? Or d does it assume that things will hang together? I think it does. And I think that's a reasonable assumption to begin with. Um, now, if we can't make things hang together, well, yeah, maybe that's the way we need to, to to revise that. But in general, things, I suppose you could say that the that, uh, the history of science is trying to see how things hang together and trying to see how d different areas of research uh, may have implications for each other and how what we learn about, say, chemistry might bear on biology and what we know about about physics and it bears on what we know about biology and how the whole thing does fit together in some way, perhaps not in a very uh, simplistic way, it might be a very complex uh, way, but the idea is that it will all hang together into a coherent picture. And that's, I think, is a reasonable assumption to be working on, uh, that there aren't just bits of the world that just are local phenomena that just don't seem to have any rational connection with related phenomena. Mm, um, mm. We don't just, I mean, one, one way of thinking about the way, I, certainly the way I think about consciousness is in terms of emergence. The idea of emergence in a strong form is that when you get certain kinds of complex systems, you get extra properties and perhaps extra causal powers that just kind of emerge in a way that is not predictable. And it's very tempting to think of the mind in that way, that when you put, when you get a brain and get it doing all its brainy stuff, these strange mental things just kind of 
occur and that we can maybe describe when they occur but exactly how and why they occur is just a sort of mystery um we know that when you get brains doing these things you get consciousness but how that happens we don't know now that's not something we find in other areas we don't find that when you put together it, the components of a of a computer in a certain way it just sort of just happens to do the stuff that computers do we can predict that it will do that from the way that we organize the components mm. um and that's how we design computers. That's how we make them. That's how you know, the whole industry depends on our being able to do that, to know what changes at the very micro level to the micro circuits, what changes they will have to the way the thing operates at a, at a macro scale and how programming those microprocessors will produce the kind of effects we want. And I think it's a reasonable assumption to think that the brain works, maybe not as a computer, but in a similar way that things don't just magically spring into existence when you get a certain kind of complexity. It can be understood in terms of what is happening at a more basic level yeah and that's part of this hanging together and that's how i think about consciousness and the mind generally so i've interviewed um philip goff for the podcast uh, and also uh patricia churchland and in fact it, now that we're talking about this this idea of trying to get things to hang together it strikes me that they are both concerned with doing that they get very different answers <laughs> but f for philip goff it's it's a topic that uh, we're going to come on to, which is phenomenal consciousness, this question of qualia, that forms a kind of linchpin, and he wants to be able to explain those. He wants to be able, those to hang together with the rest of all other sort of scientific theories, right? So he wants to bring those as within the purview of scientific explanation. So he's trying to make them hang together with science more broadly. And Patricia Churchland... Um, wants them to hang together by eliminating them, right? Mm. I'm not sure to what extent Patricia's view is eliminatorist about phenomenal properties. I mean, this is for her to, to explain, not for me, but I think some of what she says can be understood uh, better as that she wants to identify them with physical properties. There, there's a sort of reductionism that, that they are just brain properties. Not that they don't exist, but mm. they are nothing more than brain properties. Yes, okay. But I, I, I want to eliminate them. Um, and I think maybe I might go a little step further than she would want to go on. That. So that's exciting. I, I, what what I thought we should do is is set up qualia first. So talk about phenomenal properties because it, it it's very useful to have this kind of baseline. I think because then the, a lot of the theories that I want to talk about with you, including your own, are are about dealing with them in some way. So so tell us about phenomenal consciousness and qualia. What are we talking about there? Right. Okay. So there's a standard story about uh, as to how this goes. Let me tell it in a slightly different way. Um, let's take something that it's uncontroversial. We have these episodes that we could call episodes of conscious experience. You just you know, attend to something around you, something you can see or hear or smell or whatever. Attend to that carefully. Now you're having a conscious experience of that thing. It, assuming circumstances are kind of normal. Not all of our experiences perhaps are conscious in that way. Sometimes we take in information about the world around us in a sort of subliminal way. If you're walking down a busy street, you kind of adjust your behavior to the behavior of other people around you without perhaps really consciously noticing them. Okay. So in some ways, you know, you can take in information non-consciously, but when you attend to something, if you look at the cup in front of you or whatever it might be, and attend to it, then you're having a conscious experience. We can, that's, I think, everyone agrees that we need to make this distinction between information that's taken in in that way and stuff that um, that is more subliminal. And of course, if you're unconscious or if you're sleeping, you're not having these kind of experiences. Though you might be, if you're dreaming, you might be having something a bit like them. Now, that I think is pretty much uncontroversial among everyone. The question is what's, <laughs> what's happening, what's actually occurring when you're having a conscious experience. And again, I think there's a lot of stuff that we can agree on you're acquiring all kinds of information about the world. You're acquiring information about the shape and size and color and texture of the things around you. Your brain is using that information to prepare you to react to the world in various ways. If it's something that looks threatening or uh, enticing or tasty or whatever it might be, you're getting ready to react. So it's taking a lot of information. It's processing that information. It's it's classifying that it, uh, what it's seeing. So it's not just you're not just seeing a certain pattern of light and shade. You're seeing a cup. You're seeing a cup that contains coffee. Um, you're maybe seeing that the coffee looks dark or whatever. Maybe you're then getting a a lot of reactions are happening consequent on that. If you really if you're really desperate for a cup of coffee, it's something that you're disposed to pick up and 
and drink and so on and so forth. You may have associations with coffee. You may love coffee, you may hate coffee, whatever. All kinds of stuff is happening. Again, this is uncontroversial. And we can map all these processes. Um, we can list all these processes. And then we can look at the neural processes uh, that are supporting all this, what's actually happening in the brain to make to support all these kind of reactions and dispositions and so on. And again, all this is uncontroversial. And all this can be done from a third person point of view. We can describe each other's experiences in this way. I can see what it is that you are learning about the world and how you're be prepa becoming prepared to react to the world. And neuroscientists can study the, 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 the neural basis of this brain scans, they can do all kinds of things. We still only know have the story in a very sketchy, at a very sketchy level, but there seems no reason why we can't fill it in until we get pretty much everything that's happening from the moment the light hits your your retina to all the overt reactions that follow from it, you're say picking up the cup. Now, but there's supposed to be something else happening alongside all of this. And that is something that is subjective, that is not visible to others, not detectable by others, that only you know about that is private, and which you know about in, in a very special and immediate and certain way. And that is what all this is like, what the experience is like for you. And now we start to get into a bunch of uh, rather, well, I already have used a rather vague term, what it's like for me. What exactly does that mean? I've always struggled with that term, what it's like. Um, I always Because it sounds like you're about to compare it with something else. Exactly. It's, you know, <laughs> exactly. Which, is, which is not, right? So if, if, if you were to give a really sort of concise definition of phenomenal properties, could, could it be something like the way it feels to see a colour, the way it feels to touch uh, a blanket? Is it just... Um, the peculiarly, the specifically subjective feeling of some sensory input. That's a common way of doing it. And you notice that I didn't start that way. No, you didn't. And that's why I was going to ask you, you started with a, a much broader way in, which is that those things have sort of functional connections yes. and associations and meanings and all sorts. Yes. And then you said, oh, and something else is meant to be happening. And, and that's the traditional conception, right? That's that. Now, we can start with the traditional conception. The trouble is, I think, once you do this, uh, you're very quickly locked into a way of thinking about consciousness that centers these qualia, phenomenal properties, makes them the heart of the phenomenon. That makes the phenomenal properties the heart of the phenomenon, makes them the heart of consciousness. So that when you're talking about consciousness, you are just talking about things. Because we do it like this. We say, as you just did. Uh, think about what it's like to 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 see a bright, uh, a brilliant blue sky as I can at the moment. Uh, what it's like to taste coffee. What it's like to hear the sound of a, of an oboe, say, or whatever it might be. And everybody immediately says, "Well, of course, yes, of course, there's something it's like." You know, that immediately locks into something that they that they that they understand. And now you say, "Ah, but that what it, it's like? That's something only you can know. It's something we wouldn't detect in your brain if the, uh, the neuroscientist investigating your brain wouldn't actually." You know, experience that feeling that you're having. This, this that's somehow only only available to you, whatever you are in this context, from the inside, and it doesn't seem to show up on brain scans or anything like this. It's, it's, and so we've, we've now locked in on this kind of first person perspective of, and we start to use terms like the what it is likeness of experience. Mm -hmm. So now we seem to have a real, real recalcitrant thing on our hands because how on earth does this what it is likeness relate to all that stuff that we kind of uncontroversially agree is happening in, the, in our brains and all the the, the um, perceptual processes and the reactions and the dispositions and so on that go along with consciousness. This seems to be something else, some kind of subjective essence of the experience that that is in a way much more central to the experience than all that other stuff because you could imagine as it were maybe i don't have a brain maybe i don't have only that stuff but i still have this what it is i, I can't doubt that mm. away because that is the thing that's immediately present to me in the experience that is the most real thing in the world maybe i don't even have a body maybe this is the matrix but i know i'm having this what it is like great so that, actually that, that that sort of cartesian way in is is probably quite a good way of imagining it isn't it what can you doubt well you can't doubt that you're having the thought about what can you doubt? <laughs> well, this is a very tempting way in. Uh, and it's the way in that philosophers of tradition take it. It's the way in that I'm not sure how much it's the, it's a way that that we ordinarily think about these things, but with a little bit of philosophy or a little bit of, you know, homespun philosophy, we're very soon get in this way of thinking. And this rapidly inflates into a huge metaphysical problem because we have these properties, these what is it, which is, again, the, the, you mentioned the word qualia, that's 
Sometimes these words carry different connotations, but broadly we're speaking of the same thing, the subjectively presented essence of experience. Uh, qualia, phenomenal properties, raw fields, all sorts of terms with raw fields. And these just seem to belong to a kind of different world from the rest of reality. They seem to belong to a subjective world that only I have access to. Only I have. I, how do I even know you have any of these things? I can tell that you have all the reactions, the dispositions, and the so on, the perceptual processes. We can no, no problem by that. But do you have this? Is there this inner sort of light that's on this inner kind of show that's going on for you privately? And now, once we start from that way, once we start that way, and as I said, I deliberately didn't. It becomes very hard to get out of this. Um, uh, of this way of thinking of consciousness. And you get locked, uh, you get um, captured by what Daniel Dennett calls Cartesian gravity. This, mm -hmm. uh, you, you've sort of, you've traveled too near the, this, this, sort of, this, this kind of black hole and you've, <laughs> you've got, you can't escape now from the Cartesian gravity of this, with this picture of consciousness, this subjective picture of consciousness, the stuff that, that can't be doubted and so on. You've, you've, you also committed, I think, to a fairly strong conception of the self as the thing that cannot doubt these things. I mean, what is it that that cannot doubt these things? It doesn't just seem to be the brain, because how I mean, how's the brain exactly doing this? It seems to be a self. I mean, of course, Descartes thought it was an immaterial soul. A lot of people, a few people now, a few philosophers nowadays would agree with him about that. But there still seems to be something quite spooky that is actually mm. feeling and observing these properties. Because after all, there doesn't seem to be any mechanism involved. This is crucial that these properties are being directly experienced by you, not by some mechanism. Because after all, the mechanism could go wrong. It could, it could mispresent these properties to you. You could be wrong about them if there's some mechanism that's involved. If it's like a sort of uh, camera or something that's observing them. No, it's, there's some direct acquaintance between you, the real you, and these properties that are the essence of your experience. And now we seem to be, this is inflating quite a lot metaphysically. And uh, this is how you have to go if you want to take these properties and this perspective on consciousness seriously. And for a lot of people, as David Charles, this is taking consciousness seriously. I think it's taking consciousness um, uh, well, badly. I think it's, it's approaching it from a, a perspective from which we're we're creating a kind of artifact for ourselves that is inexplicable, and then we're proclaiming we have a big mystery about it. Mm. But it's an artifact of the way we've approached it. So there's quite a lot there. <laughs> yeah, there is quite a lot there. But it, it's reminded me of the, uh, the term a Cartesian split that um, that what Descartes did, um, I don't know if really he was the first, but certainly the most influential, was introduce this sort of fundamental chasm between the world and mind, which may be a, a sort of binary that we could reject overall. So if, if, you, if we started like you did, which is to talk about the relationship we have with a cup of coffee, that we we act in the world, we're part of the world. So the, the the coffee cup, we can use it, we can drink out of it, we can touch it, we can. So we're part of the world and we act in the world. Instead of thinking as of ourselves as kind of a, almost behind a, a screen, watching information about some external world, and then occasionally choosing to sort of act within it or dip into it, we're actually part of it from the beginning. Was that part of what you were trying to do by setting us up in that way? Yes. I mean, I think that's right. I, I, I think there is this this um, metaphor that Daniel Dennett uses of the Cartesian theatre. And it's very tempting, the idea that, that what's happening is our senses are gathering information about the world. And each of them is, is sort of doing this separately. Vision, in fact, different elements of the visual system are extracting different kinds of information about colour and, uh, and shape and, and uh, distance and so on. And then uh, the other senses also gathering information about the world. But somehow this is all kind of put together into a grand show where the world is presented to you <laughs> as a unified whole. And this is what Dennett calls the Cartesian theatre. There is this kind of inner centre uh, 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 where all of this sense of information is assembled and presented in a sort of qualia show to some kind of observer. Now, this doesn't seem to make any sense. Which is uh, a sort of homunculus? Is that the, uh, well, is that exactly. the term he would use? Uh, that's, well... You, you're sort of tacitly assuming a, a little person what who is somehow you watching the show, but then that doesn't really answer the question. Exactly, because how, how are they, how are they, how do, how does the, how do their perceptual systems work? Yes, and I don't, now I don't think many philosophers, even ones who are, you know, realists about, about phenomenal consciousness would endorse that picture. But 
then it would say they're still influenced by it. It's still exerting a sort of Cartesian gravity on them. And, uh, uh, and that's, and they, that you need to, to get rid of that picture. You've not only got to get rid of this idea of there being a, a center, a theater, and a homunculus who's watching, but you also need to get rid of the idea of the show. And what we've done is we've kind of said, well, of course, there isn't really a center there where every, there isn't like, I mean, Descartes thought there was. He thought it was in the, the pineal gland, uh, yes. which then transmitted the information to the, uh, to the soul, which was the observer, the immaterial soul. Now, what, now we, most modern philosophers who know something about neuroscience have got rid of that, but they still have the idea that there's a show. Now, of course, the, the metaphysical status of the show and how it's related to all the physical processes is a big problem. And there's another huge problem, which is who is observing this show or, uh, or who is it that's acquainted with this show? For whom, for whom is this show happening? And I don't think that question, that question isn't asked often enough. Um, because if you say, well, it's just the brain, the cognitive system, well, how on earth is this huge, complex cognitive system acquainted with this simple kind of metaphysically distinct show? I mean, how does that happen? I mean, are there sort of mechanisms, detectors? And if they are, how can they be so reliable that we are always absolutely correct about the nature of the show? How could it be presented to us in this immediate way? I mean, why can't we just look at these detectors in the brain and work out and sort of translate their inputs and outputs and access the show uh, from a third person perspective? Mm. It's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be revealed directly to something. Uh, the, the, so again, we the, the idea is we need to get rid of that entire picture and all the elements of it. Can, can we just talk, so I know I know you want to reject the sort of traditional uh, definition of of qualia because it sets up the argument in the wrong way for the conclusion that you want to make. Um, <laughs> but but it's quite helpful, I think, to to just be really clear about it, partly so we can understand mm -hmm. other people's theories. Mm -hmm. So. Can we have a sort of uh, a sentence that defines qualia and and explains what their properties are? You use the word simple. They are somehow fundamental or irreducible, or that is that part of the definition? Well, uh, that my is... feeling of redness or the, the the particular texture of uh, this desk or this piece of wood or this piece of paper, the particular color, shape, those things can't be broken down in in some way in terms of the way I'm experiencing them. They're somehow like atoms of experience. If you... I'm not sure. I think you'd find qualia realists who who would say that the, there is structure there that you can uncover introspectively. Um, this is actually tricky. Uh, the, the sort of history of this is, if you like, that um, in a 1986, I think, paper called Quining Qualia. Quining, quining in this context just means denying the existence of. Um, uh, but it's actually a joke about the relation to the, uh, reference to the philosopher Willard Quine. Now, th so in this paper written by Daniel Dennett, he takes what he sees as the traditional notion of qualia and, and he identifies various features of it that these things are private, radically private. They only, can only be known by you in principle. No it, uh, instruments could detect them. They are, they are in effort. Not sure if I can get all the, the, the features. They're ineffable. You can't describe them. If I ask you to describe what yellow is like for you in such a way that I could then compare it with what yellow is like for me and tell whether they're the same, you couldn't do it. The most you could do is maybe mention its relation. You could tell me what things are yellow, but of course that doesn't tell me how yellow looks. We can both agree that bananas are yellow, but is yellow the same for you as it is for me? You could mention relations between them. Say yellow is more like orange than it is like like blue, say, okay. But that still wouldn't rule out the possibility that all of these relations are systematically inverted or uh, uh, yes. uh, transposed between us. So they're supposed to be ineffable. You can't characterize them in a way that really completely pins down their nature for another person. They're supposed to be um, directly, immediately presented to you. There's no possibility of your being wrong about them provided you're paying proper attention to them. Okay, uh, so, with the, so they're private, they're ineffable, uh, and you know them with absolute certainty. Oh, yeah. yes. And I think the other, uh, another one is that they're intrinsic. They're not relational properties, like relations be the, between you and the, and the, uh, 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 the cup or whatever it is. They are, it's, it's the, it's a, they're properties of the experience itself. They don't just represent things in the world. They're, they're actually, the, it's the intrinsic nature of the experience. Um, the experience could carry different information, yet still have that same feel, or it could carry the same uh, information and have uh, a different feel. 
So they can't be explained in relational terms. They can't be cashed out in relation. So he took these features and he did a pretty good job of showing that it was, um, that there couldn't really be properties of experience that have these features. Uh, in, in the very sort of strong form that they were traditionally supposed to to be. And in response to that, a lot of people who wanted to be realists about qualia said, well, okay, well, maybe maybe qualia don't have all those features. Uh, maybe some of those are kind of illusions that uh, we have about qualia. But still, there's something there. There is still a, the, the, the feel of the thing. Now, maybe it's not really intrinsic. Maybe it's not really ineffable. Maybe it's not really completely private. But it's still there. There's still... There's this feel there, right? There's this yellow feel that I have when I look at a banana. And that's what we need to try and explain, that thing. So let's drop all these assumptions about the nature of qualia. There still is the core thing there that needs explaining. Now, I uh, um, I wrote a paper a few years ago in which I, 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 I tried to challenge that move. I called it quining diet qualia. So diet qualia. So the idea is that you have this kind of classic, uh, you know, full strength qualia with all the the sugar and the um, uh, and the caffeine or whatever, and then you have a diet version that sort of slimmed down and gets rid of these these bits that aren't good for you. But it's still it's still the the, you know, the real thing. <laughs> um, and I tried to show that really once you stripped out all of this stuff, you didn't really have anything left as a coherent thing to talk about. And I think actually I think that was. Dennett's point too. I think he'd always assumed that 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 um, there was no coherent weaker notion. Um, but a lot of people would doubt that. But then we are just left with this brute intuition that there's something there that we can't really, uh, we can't pin down in this in this way. Well, it doesn't hang together with other things, right? Well, it just slips through your fingers now. If it's if it's not this kind of ineffable essence, I mean, an effable intrinsic essence. I mean, that's peculiar, right? But at least I kind of have an idea of what it is. It's this peculiar, ineffable, intrinsic thing, the essence of the experience. Now you're telling me it needn't be ineffable. It needn't be intrinsic. It's <laughs> so what am I left with? I'm left with this gesture at, at the kind of, this is what it's like for me now. And, and, and also, let me, let me add a, a third thing that I think is, is often kind of glossed over here. When you ask somebody what, what their experience is like, they, te- they describe it in properties of, in terms of properties of the world. It's the yellowness that you experience. It's, it's a seems to be out there in the banana that you're looking at. The blue is out there in the sky. The sounds are out there in the air. The smell is in, the, in your nose or in the, in the air around. Now, that's not how, what qualia is supposed to be. They're supposed to be in here, private things. They're features of the experience itself, not features of the world. And this move is one that was made in 17th century, I guess, where when uh, modern science you know, began to be able to describe the world in terms that didn't mention any of these these properties. If you ask what's out, what is actually there in the surface of the banana, it's not yellowness. It's a certain structural properties that reflect light. Uh, in a certain, the atoms of the banana skin aren't yellow, and the right. structures. And, and if you um, if you uh, pay attention to to Philip Goff, his book Galileo's Error is, I think, about to come out actually, uh, and Galileo's Error itself is broadly, I think, t- defining phenomenal properties out of the purview of scientific explanation. Ah, but Galileo made another error, you see, which I think is even more, even more serious. He put them in our minds. They don't seem to be out there. The yellowness isn't out there on the surface of the banana, no. But the yellowness must still be somewhere because it's so vivid and real and it's, oh my gosh, you know, the yellowness, wow, what's that? Well, it's not there, so it must be in here. Now, that's, I think, Galileo's second and bigger error, if you like. And Philip still agrees with him that these things are somehow in here. They're still the, 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 what science says about the banana is that the kind of it's the, the, the yellowness that seems to be painted over the banana is illusory. What's there is a certain, uh, certain reflective properties of the, the surface. The natural move is, well, okay, so it's the, the, the yellowness out there is illusory. But the yellowness can't just be illusory to core. It must be somewhere. So it's got to be in here. Now, why not just say it's illusory? It exists, as it were, only as we, we represent the banana to ourselves as being yellow. That's true. We think of the banana as being yellow. We, class, we, we, we judge it to be yellow. We have all kinds of reactions to the banana that are based on our uh, representing it as yellow. And that's all as far as it goes. Mm. We don't need to actually have this yellowness somewhere, either out there or in here. Okay, okay. So n- now we're into your 
version of things. So this is called illusionism, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was reading, you, you sent me an advanced copy of a, an article you, you wrote for Eon where you lay this out. I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll pop, pop the link in the, in the show notes to this. This is an article for a popular audience um, on the magazine, um, online magazine Eon, which is fantastic, where Keith puts forward his views. Um, I, and I read through that and I was trying to grapple with this idea of illusionism <laughs> um, that you propose. And it, and it I felt at, the, at a certain point, I felt like I, I got it. And let's, let's see. <laughs> let's see. It felt like what you're doing is you're switching what we're claiming to be is irreducibly phenomenal, exhaustively phenomenal in character. You're switching that with a kind of belief that we're telling ourselves, we're representing ourselves as having a phenomenal experience. So we're telling ourselves that we're having an experience with a certain character. But actually, we're not. <laughs> so so what is 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 this along the right lines that we're telling ourselves that this experience of yellowness in the banana has certain characteristics mm -hmm. but but actually if we look more closely we're not having those that experience we're just telling ourselves that we're having that experience that's pretty pretty that's pretty much much it um that's the negative part of the story. That's okay. the, well, that's the negative <laughs> part of the story. I mean, I mean, obviously, I want to add a few sort of extra bits and pieces, but that's broad, broadly the idea. I want me to think of illusionism as, as having two components, a negative component and a positive component. And that's important. Um, that's why I like the word illusionism. It's an older word is eliminativism. Eliminativism means you, you sort of you get rid of talk of a certain kind of thing. Like, we, we, I guess we're pretty much most of us are eliminativists about the idea of demonic possession as a way of explaining mental illness. You eliminate that sort of talk um, because it's not helpful. Now, uh, the negative part of illusion is, is just eliminativism about phenomenal talk of qualia and phenomenal properties. And it's rejecting that picture that we've just been talking about. It's this idea of there being some immediate essence of the experience that is immediately presented to you, whatever you are, um, and that is the, the heart of what consciousness is, rejecting that picture. Now, the positive side of it is explaining why that picture is so tempting, because there's no doubt that that picture, that way of thinking about consciousness is very, very, very compelling. And we only, we, you know, we, we take a few steps and you suggested how we start talking about the what it, what an experience is like. And then we, we get, we say things like, but how do I know that what it's like for you is what it's like for me? And so we get this idea that it's private and it's not something that we could uh, infer from knowledge of what's happening in our brains, what it actually feels like. We couldn't tell that from just looking at the, the, the patterns of activity in our, in our, in our sensory cort cortex or something like that. So it, it's very easy to to get into that way of thinking about consciousness. And that is itself a very interesting fact about consciousness, that it's very easy for us to take this Cartesian view. The Cartesian view is compelling. Now, I'm saying, because I'm reject, because I'm not taking that view seriously, I'm saying that, that that view is actually false. So I'm saying that what we have is a kind of Cartesian illusion. And that needs explaining. Why is this picture so compelling? And I think it's compelling because actually, I think it's kind of useful Mm, okay. I think what are judgments about when we talk about judgments about color and, and and pain, for example, obviously, we're not we're not talking about nothing at all. It's not that nothing at all is happening here. Certainly, a lot of stuff is the kind of stuff I started talking about about the how we're representing the world, the, the information we're picking up, the sensitivities, the way that we're classifying the world, the, the, the reactions that are being generated. We're seeing the world as something that has meaning for us. We're seeing the coffee as something that has that is tasty and reviving or whatever. We're feeling the pain as something that is distressing and, and, and harmful and that we need to avoid, that has all kinds of significance for us in psychological terms, not in purely phenomenal terms, in psychological terms, in terms that we can explain in terms of reactions and dispositions and, and so on, and judgments. And I think our judgments about when we talk about the pain, we're actually just sort of generalizing over a whole lot of reactions and sensitivities and dispositions that are being triggered by the that are by this particular stimulus. Okay, so it, the, the coffee cup, the banana, what, what, any of the things we've. It's the meaning of it, if you like. When we talk about what it's like, mm. we talk about the meaning of this perceptual this perceptual episode. What significance it has? All the and, and this may be uh, 
all kinds of things may feed into this. Our memories of coffee, our uh, uh, associations that coffee has to us, whether you know, all kinds of things. The, 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 and this is an incredibly rich pattern of um, reaction. And I think that's what gives the notion of the, the, the what it is likeness. It's kind of punch. But we, we're kind of packing uh, all of this, uh, all of this immensely rich uh, uh, range of reactions into a kind of simple, um, we're, we're sort of wrapping it up with this simple little label of the feel, the pain, the what it is likeness. Mm. And we're representing it to ourselves in that way. And this is kind of useful because we can't really get a handle on all of the complexity of what's going on here. And so introspection, as it were, when we sort of ask ourselves what this experience is like for ourselves, it presents it to us in a very simple caricatured way as the feel. But there isn't really any feel. There's just this complex pattern of response to the world. But that, is, that, isn't, that isn't a feel. I mean, you could say, well, that is the feel then. But no, I don't want to say that because I don't think there is a feel in that sense. There is just a, something that is represented to us that we treat, that we judge as a feel. Are, are you replacing a feeling with a belief? Not merely with a belief, with representational states of all sorts of kinds, many of which may be less articulate than beliefs. I mean, if you think of a belief as something that you could uh, articulate in language, no, it's a whole lot. Uh, I'm replacing it, if you like, with a whole cluster of reactions and reactive dispositions, mm. yes. But they can be much more, um, uh, much less explicit. I'm certainly not replacing it with conscious beliefs. I mean, the conscious beliefs are a part of it. You know, beliefs that you could articulate and report to someone. It's much richer than that. But I'm replacing it with representational states, certainly. Because it, um, it's just it's making me think a little bit of the um, the Mary, the neuroscientist mm -hmm. argument, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I, well, I very simply put is uh, if you have a neuroscientist who's grown up in a black and white mm -hmm. laboratory and never left, and she's called Mary, and Mary understands everything there is to know about the neuroscience and neurophysiology mm -hmm. of color perception, but she's never seen anything except black and white, but she understands about the retina, about the visual processing system. She, has, she knows everything there is to know in some future advanced neuroscience. The, the thought experiment is that when she then leaves the laboratory and sees a rose, a red rose for the first time, her experience of redness, she learns something new. Mm -hmm. And and that, that new thing on on that argument, I believe, is phenomenal, is qualitative, is a raw feel. Mm -hmm. And so that moves from uh, I guess knowledge, mm -hmm. um scientific knowledge to experiential mm -hmm knowledge if if that's you know the, mm -hmm. the the experience of redness and 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 the, the the idea is that there's an unbridgeable gap between those two but you seem to be going the other way <laughs> in in a sense I, re I realize you've said it's not necessarily explicit belief but you're saying that our, our experience of redness for example or any phenomenal thing is really a, a has a sort of re is represented in our brains as having certain properties or certain connections with other functional uh, dispositions, ways we can use, interact, mm -hmm. the meaning of it, mm -hmm. and and presenting itself as if it had something like phenomenal properties. So you're, you're going from the experience to the knowledge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, or turning the one into the other. Do, do, do you see the parallel I'm making? I'm, I'm slightly grasping. At... No, I think that's, I, I think no, I, I, I think that's right. Um, the idea is that that Mary knows all the physical facts about color vision. Um, that's sort of stipulated that she has it. She lives in the future when the science of color vision is com is complete. So she knows all the physical facts about it. But when she goes out, she learns some a new fact about color vision, namely what it's like to see red. Mm. Um, and therefore, there are further facts than the physical facts. There are extra facts about the world which aren't captured by the physical picture of the world. Uh, now, I deny that. I mean, I think that, of course, she hasn't, it's, it, everyone agrees that she hasn't had a color experience. She hasn't actually seen colors. That's true. She hasn't had this experience. But she could have learned everything about 
that experience, what that experience, um, uh, everything about that experience inside her room. So if she'd had, if she'd had all the details of the the perceptual processes that are involved in, in seeing red, uh, and all the reactions that red would evoke f would evoke for her. Now it'd be difficult to have this actually because she wouldn't probably have she wouldn't have the sort of associations that are with uh, uh, with red that we have. We have for us red carries a lot of significance because you know we're used to see i mean red means stop right and red is the color of tomatoes and red means red has all sorts of connections for us that it wouldn't have for her because she's been colorblind um it's not, not colorblind, she's been in a black and white room so when she first sees red i don't would she have all those associations would she say well there's something happening here that's weird and I, I know, it's just, uh, I guess this is the firing of what so-and-so and so-and-so. And she tells a story about the, the neural processes involved and tells about the activity in her visual cortex and so on. Ah, it's really strange not to have this before. She wouldn't be suddenly immediately acquainted with some distinctive essence of this experience that had been hidden from her by the physical picture. Um, and in fact, I think her experience will be very different from ours, precisely because she doesn't have all those associations. Red doesn't really mean anything to her. Uh, you know, red is our representations of red of a sort of. Um, uh, and here's an analogy that might help. It's l looking at a movie. Now, what you're actually seeing is a series of still images. What's actually in front of your eyes is a series of still images. You're not. There's no actual movement on the screen. Series of still images, but your visual system represents it as movement. Misrepresents it. There isn't actually nothing's actually moving. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing. There's, there's actually anything there. Just patterns of light on the screen. But you see a, a scene. You see people running and and, and or, mm. whatever it is. That's an illusion of a sort. I think that's sort of the illusion that we have. It's analogous to the illusion we have introspectively. What we're actually sensitive to, what we're actually detecting, is a whole bunch of reactions to the world. And we kind of simplify that, represent that to ourselves as this feel. There isn't actually a simple feel. There just there isn't actually motion there. That's just something that we, well, as you you could say something that we believe is there. You could say that, but I mean, I'd want to say that we represent it at some more basic level, perhaps than that. It doesn't have to be articulated okay. into belief. But we represent ourselves as having these simple, just as we represent the movement on the on on the screen now. Mary, I think, wouldn't have all this range of reactions to, to colours in the first case, in the first place. So she, I don't think she would have anything like our colour experiences. But it, whatever she has, she could know about completely from a dis, from a physical description of them. Okay. Provided, of course, that that that, that included information about the significance that these things had had for her in the past, or for whoever it was that, that she knew all about the reactions, the associations, the memories, the connections, the feelings that colors evoked okay okay so th this this talk of representation i want to just see if we can use this to talk about um the higher order mm -hmm. theory of consciousness now the reason i bring that up is because um i interviewed as i said joseph ledoux the neuroscientist who's done a lot of work on uh, emotion uh, and he advocates a higher order theory of consciousness now the way you're talking about representation uh, and and being uh, misled by a kind of representation of a sensory experience sounds like there's some resonance there with yeah, the higher order theory in definitely. that um, great well can can you explain what well first can you just explain what the higher order theory is and 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 then maybe explain how your your account has a similar structure right yeah um, that's a good point I am. Um, most higher high theories are typically cast in as explanations of phenomenal consciousness, uh, explanations of you know, how experiences come to have phenomenal properties. That's where I think they go wrong. Um, so the idea is really that you have uh, experiences of the world, perceptions of the world, which are just kind of functional states of your of your brain, and these are not conscious and they can do all the work they can do the work of representing the world representing colors and enabling you to react to the world in appropriate ways without being conscious so all this could just go on as it were under the surface you could take an information classify the information react appropriately without being conscious you become con and this arguably is, does happen a lot of the time if you're most 
people have the experience of driving while they're thinking about something else, engaged in a conversation, and kind of not really noticing what has been happening outside the the the, 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 um, the other traffic. But of course, they must. And, and in in uh, psychological experiments, you can. Uh, do something called subliminal perception, oh, yes, yes, yes. where you where you flash up an image. Say, I mean, in Joseph Ledoux's case, he's done a lot of work on fear, um, and so you can flash up a sort of terrifying image so briefly that people have it, they can report no awareness of having seen an image at all. But you can track that parts of their visual cortex are registering the presence of that image and are responding and even that there are there are some sort of uh, physiological responses to the presence of a threat that are being initiated so the idea is that there's some sort of low level sensory processing that's happening very quickly that you're not aware of so there's a distinction between perception and awareness that's being made there yeah, which is what you're talking about as well yeah and, and as i say i think that's that, that accords pretty well with common sense we you know we, i'm just walking down the street you can you're clearly sensitive to all kinds of of, of, of uh, information about the other people, about the you know the, the way that the street turns or whatever, and you, you navigate successfully without being uh, aware of that and without being consciously aware of that. Now, and so the idea then is that where, how does consciousness come? In? Well, it comes in when you have another. Um, mental state that represents that first one. So the first mental state is representing the world, and then you have another mental state that represents that one. So as it were, the, the experience itself is becoming an object of um, thought or experience. You're actually thinking. Right, or so this this is the this is the higher, higher order, order theory. The higher order. This theory. is the sort of the higher level of representation right. representing the lower levels. Exactly. Of the basic sensory process. So you need two representations: representation of the world, and then a representation of that representation. Okay, and that's not so different from the sort of story that I'm telling. You have these rep these representations of the world, and then you have a representation of them, which misrepresents them as having phenomenal properties, having this this, this intrinsic feel to them. How does that differ from the standard um, uh, higher order thought or higher order representation theory? Well, because standardly, this the higher order representation theories are taken to actually explain phenomenal consciousness. The, the idea is that when you have this higher order um, representation, then you are actually experiencing phenomenal properties that, that somehow creates phenomenal consciousness. Now I'm saying it doesn't. It creates the illusion of phenomenal consciousness. Mm. It makes us it doesn't actually confer phenomenal properties on either the first experience or the higher order experience or on something else. It just makes it seem that the first order experience has phenomenal properties. So it's I think if you detach the um, higher order representational theory from these realist assumptions. I just think it's not quite pulled itself. Or it's it's getting sort of almost broken out of the of the um, of the, Cart the 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 pull of Cartesian gravity, but not quite. And it's still sort of circling back in. It just needs a little bit more boost to just get out there and and uh, and break away. Yes, and so presumably you you've just got le sort of a cognitive architecture, if you like, with you know sort of incoming information that gets then represented at su sort of successively more abstract levels, yes. um, and that's a higher order theory. Mm -hmm. um, it's something like the story you're telling as well. Mm -hmm. Presumably, you can you can make uh, robots, androids with exactly that feature, right? We, we could. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done. No, no, absolutely. I mean, and I, one of the, another troubling thing about the idea of phenomenal consciousness is that if it is private in this way, um, all we really know about it is that human brains produce it. Although we, we can't explain why. We just know that it happens in the human brains, that you get them to a certain level of complexity and certain processes are going on, bam, you get phenomenal consciousness. Although, of course, actually, you only know that in your own case. <laughs> um, you can't be sure it happens. Now, but that leaves it completely mysterious. Uh, it leaves it a complete mystery as to what would happen if you tried to replicate those kind of processes in another material. If you tried to replicate perceptual processes in silicon, non-biological materials, they might do the, perform the same functions, but would they produce this, this, this inner feel? And but there's absolutely no way of knowing. The most you couldn't be sure of is that they're imitating the 
reactions and they, they're behaving like us. They're having the same responses to things, they're making the same judgments, perhaps even declaring that they are conscious, because that, after all, is just another reaction. Mm. Whether there is really is this private inner essence, well, there's absolutely no way of knowing. So we, if, but, if, but isn't 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 the isn't the the ramification of your theory that the illusion of mm-hmm. phenomenal mm-hmm. properties is arising from features of the cognitive architecture and but sh- surely you could create a cognitive architecture in a, a non-biological oh absolutely you know, absolutely. Material. absolutely so so but if your theory is right shouldn't then it it follow that they would also think that mm, they had phenomenal absolutely. properties absolutely that's the, the the problem that i was describing there of the the sort of inscrutability of 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 artificial consciousness the fact that we could never know whether we create that that's a feature of the cartesian view if you parcel it away as this mysterious inner thing, then you can never know whether whether a robot would have it. And therefore, if you think that that's the essence of like moral uh, uh, status, you know, having this inner life is what makes something. We would never ever, in principle, be able to tell whether artificial intelligences had moral status, whether it was okay to 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 harm them or not. Now, now, yeah, my view is it doesn't have that consequence at all. It says that being conscious in the way that we are. It's just a matter of having certain kinds of um, introspective representations, of representing our mental mental processes in a certain way. And we can identify the mechanisms that are responsible for that. And if we replicate those mechanisms in another creature, in a different medium, then it will have what we have. And there's there's nothing hidden on this view. It's a simple, it's it's not a simple matter, it's a very complex matter, but a matter of very very complex mechanisms that we can identify and replicate. So we'd, if we replicated those mechanisms, they'd be just as conscious as we are. Okay. So let, um, I realize we haven't given space to like the most obvious objection, um, which I, I was definitely feeling when I was reading your article and trying to really trying to get my head around it. We, we, and it's sort of, I glanced off it by saying you, you seem to be replacing a raw feel with something like a a belief even if it's not that explicit Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. it's a it's a representation with certain features Mm -hmm. and it's and and the objection is something like no i'm i'm feeling that i'm i I feel it and telling me that i'm not really feeling it is you just can't do that like yes i am (laughs) is the objection right It, it just i i don't see how you can switch it or are you just telling me that I'm just disposed to say that, even though I'm not feeling it's, these phenomenal it's properties. It's all about your reactions in various kinds of ways, not just beliefs, but all sorts of reactions. Uh, and I think the reason it seems implausible is because we underestimate the complexity of these reactions and the way they hang together and the, and the, the way that they affect us emotionally, uh, the way that they change our there's all kind of stuff going on in us that we're not explicitly aware of, but that we are aware of the upshot of. We're aware that seeing that sort of makes you just feel funny. <laughs> it has an odd reaction. Now, there's all kinds of processes underlying that that we don't know about. What we know is the upshot of it. But the point is, it's always about the effect. The uh, Suppose there were this inner show. Suppose there were this inner feel. A show is kind of idle unless somebody's watching it and reacting to it. Hmm. Suppose there were this, you know, this, this thing being shown in my head. These, these quietly were there. What's there's all kinds of stuff happening in my head that I'm not aware of. I mean, the, I guess the magnet, my brain must have magnetic properties. Maybe it has radioactive properties. I don't, I don't know about them. They don't, they're nothing to me. Properties that I don't detect and react to are nothing to me. Now, if there's this show going off there, and no one's watching it and reacting to it, then the show is nothing for me. <laughs> It's all in the reaction. This is how Dan, this is what Daniel Dan, Dan talks about, the, not the hard problem of consciousness, but the hard question of consciousness, which is, and then what happens? So, okay, so all these this this these these, these neural processes happen. Then consciousness emerges, and then you have this show. And then what happens? Who observes the show? Who reacts to it? How do they react? It's all in the reaction. A show with no one in the in the theatre. Or with a bunch of people in the theatre who are all asleep and not reacting and not forming beliefs and representations about it, might as well not be there. Mm. Without the effects on us, without the beliefs, without the representations, without the reactions, consciousness is nothing. Uh, uh, there's a, an example I, 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 I like to try people. 
suppose you're going to have an operation and the operation is going to be very painful. And you could you have your choice of two kinds of anesthetics. Now, let's suppose for the moment that we buy into the idea of qualia. Now, one of them will quell the qualia. One of these anesthetics will quell the qualia. The qualia will be switched off. There won't be this pain show in your head. But all the reactions will continue as normal. So you will be screaming, you'll be begging not to, to, for them to stop, you'll be saying, you'll be weeping, your be, heart will be pounding, you'll be, you'll be in, you know, expressing agony in every possible way. You'll believe that you are in absolute agony. You will firmly, deeply uh, uh, believe that. The other one will do the opposite. It will quell all the reactions. You'll lie there perfectly still. You won't believe that anything is happening to you. You'll believe that everything is just fine. You'll be quiet and like a lamb. Uh, but the qualia will still be there. Mm. But you won't be reacting to the qualia. Now, I'm certain the surgeon would prefer you to take the second one. Mm. Which would you prefer to take? Now, uh, I, th I think what that question does is help to put pressure on the idea that you can separate out the feel from the reaction. Mm. Yeah, it's great. It's a great thought experiment. Yeah, they, they they just you 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 think well that's ridiculous. You can't be showing all of the uh, behavioural manifestations of pain and not be feeling pain. Like that doesn't make sense. And the, the, essentially, the, the, the illusionist idea is that what the pain is is a label for all those reactions. It's a sort of shorthand label for all those reactions. That's all it is. And th these reactions are so complex, so subtle that it, it, it make, that you know. It seems like, well, that wouldn't account for that. That couldn't account for it because we're not aware of them. We're not, we're not, now, Mary, of course, would be aware of them because she would know all the details of these reactions that are happening when you see different colors. She would know all the, the triggers that are being, that are being, uh, the, the, the switches that are being flipped and all that. She would say, well, seeing colors, it's a massively, it's like a sort of tsunami of effects within the brain. Yeah, that's going to be pretty significant. And she would know about that. So she would have a pretty good, she would probably find illusionism quite convincing because she would know what, what is really happening. We don't, we just go, well, whatever, something happened. My God, it's the, it's the feel of this thing. Yeah, the feel, that's it. That's all. I, we're not neuroscientists. We don't know what we are. We are sort of very naive, <laughs> introspective neuroscientists who say, you know, that thing's happened again. You know, I've, I, I've seen that. I've that thing happened. What? I don't know. That thing, the thing that we call red and it has all that oof, oomph. It affects mm. us in that way. And it makes me go, mm. ah, like that. That's red. Yeah. That's okay. That's all happening. The illusion is, and that involved some intrinsic redness being instantiated somewhere as a mysterious non-physical property over and above all the other aspects of the oomph. <laughs> Sorry, that was, I used to, um, I, your listeners won't be able to see the hand gestures here, but they are very important to the picture. Yes. They're getting increasingly furious <laughs> and uh, vibrant. <laughs> somebody, somebody once said that when I was giving a talk on this. They said it sounded like you were preaching, Keith. And, <laughs> and damn it, I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's sort of pull back a little bit. Um, wh wh where does this illusionist or the the research program of illusionism? go from here um where does it fit into sort of the broader agenda perhaps of investigating consciousness or the mind next great yeah um that's the positive aspect of the program that this is why it's not just eliminativism you guys eliminate this bad way of thinking and start work on the the good way of thinking start, we, 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 the, as far as uh, there's a problem of specifically phenomenal consciousness it's now becomes a problem of explaining why we think we are phenomenally conscious explaining why Cartesian gravity has such a pull for creatures like us. What kind of introspective mechanism? What, when I say introspection, I mean some kind of monitor. We can somehow monitor what's happening inside us in a way I suspect that other animals can't. It's not just that we react to the world. We can react to our reactions to the world. We can, we can classify experiences as being, it's one of those experiences again. I, and we use phenomenal terms here. It's one of that sort of, and we can pursue experiences for their own sake. We can, we can turn experiences into objects for us. Experiences become part of our world as well as the, the regular furniture of the external world. Our own experiences become part of our world. And that's what we need to look at the mechanisms that are involved in this kind of introspection, internal monitoring, and how they produce all these kinds of 
of intuitions we have about phenomenal consciousness. Now, I, I, I mentioned a really uh, interesting piece of uh, line of research here, which is that of the psychologist uh, Nicholas Humphrey. In two, I don't know if you've know of Nick's work in 2011, he wrote a lovely, lovely book. Yes, called, I do a bit. Yes, I do. Yeah, a lovely book called Soul Dust. Uh, in, in that book, he was a pretty explicit illusionist. I mean, his view, I, did, I don't think he used that term, but he, his view was very much in line with illusionism. He's, he's since uh, expressed some reservations, mainly, I think, about the, the presentation of the position rather than the details. But in that, he argues that this illusion of this rich, special inner world is actually highly adaptive and that it's, it's uh, evolution selected for it because it gave us all kinds of advantages. That it's doing real work. So it, it, this is another problem, of course, for the Cartesian view. It's, it's, if this thing is kind of ineffable and and so on, what, what, you know, what what's uh, what's it doing for us? Why does it exist? Is it just a kind of side effect of what the brain is really doing? And it's and, and then you get into this position of epiphenomenalism, where it it is just a side effect. Mm. But uh, Nick argues that the uh, the illusion of consciousness is a really highly useful one for us, and it's the it really creates the kind of world that we live in, which is a world populated with these with people with, in inverted commas, souls, with these inner, inner, inner realms of private specialness. Uh, so that's, I see it, that's one very interesting line of development for an illusionist theory. Is that, is that anything like, um, no, I might be mixing them metaphors here anything like the intentional stance then it's oh. idea that, that it's it's useful to treat people as if and so it sort of evolved or is that <sighs> just off the mark uh i could see the connections i'm not i think it's 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 a sort of self-application of the intentional stance, applying it to yourself um mm. it's well the intentional stance is primarily about propositional attitudes about beliefs and desires and so on it's more like what Dan, uh, uh, Dan it calls heterophenomenology which is doing this self uh, description of experience um producing a kind of narrative about what it's like for you and don't think this is really interesting stuff to do and it's a very provides very important information about what is actually happening but it shouldn't be taken just straight at face value. If you say for instance I mean an example that you're rotating a mental image in your mind's eye uh, if you if you asked like an, an IQ test to sort of rotate that image and see whether it would align with another one, you may say, "Well, I actually rotated the image in my mind." Well, that's how it seemed to you. Whether there was actually something in there, some like representation, sort of uh, two dimensional representation that was actually rotated, that's a totally different different issue. But it's very interesting to know how it seemed to you because that tells you that's sort of diagnostic of the actual processes. It's not a transparent window on them. And that's that's I suppose that's one way of putting um, the illusionist perspective that it's diagnostic of what's happening, not 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 um, a revelation of it. I think that's that's, that's okay. the, the crucial feature of the of the Cartesian view is that consciousness reveals itself to us completely and transparently. Mm. And I think it's pretty obvious that the idea that if we are just parts of the natural world, as I guess a lot of people think we are, how one part of the natural world could transparently and completely reveal itself to another part without any sort of mechanism it's mm. you know this sounds, seems as if there's something a bit spooky going on there and indeed yes. people think there is okay let's let's um move away from illusionism we, we, we're sort of coming to the end now but I, I didn't want to only talk about this kind of uh philosophical work i i know that you've done a lot, a lot of work on dual process stuff as well um and uh we haven't got time to sort of really explore that but but can you just tell us a little bit about i mean this seems to me more obviously empirical work or connected mm -hmm. with empirical work well it started for, with a more philosophical interest which was in the, the status of what is called folk psychology you referred to to dennett's intentional stance we understand each other in terms of our having beliefs and desires and thoughts and intentions and hopes and plans and so on. And we have we know that if somebody believes that they should be in a certain place at a certain time and they want to be there at that time, then they will tend to be there at that time. And we use this to coordinate our activities and this way of thinking of each other. Um, and there was a big debate when I was uh, in graduate school about the status of this this theory, this folks like, do we actually really have you know, our beliefs and desires actually sort of little sort of encodings in our heads that kind of get activated mm. and uh, like 
registers and um, uh, entries in a uh, computer memory? Or is it just a kind of useful shorthand way of understanding each other that enables us to get, get, get on with each other, but isn't really serious psychology? Yeah. Uh, and or is it as as the, um, uh, Patricia and Paul Churchill would say, you're really just a really quite bad theory of what's going on, and we should replace it with something better provided by by neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, and so this interested me, and so I started thinking about just first of all just looking at our everyday practices of using belief, desire, explanations, and I rapidly came to the conclusion that they were actually doing two quite different sorts of things. Uh, one, which is looking at um, unreflective behavior, explaining unreflective behavior. Why Why did the person, uh, when, when they got into the car, why did they put the key in the ignition? Well, they believed that that was how to start the car. Why did they press the indicator stalk down? Because they wanted to signal a turn. And this all makes sense. You can explain this in terms of what they knew about the car and how it worked and what they wanted to do. They wanted to travel somewhere. So, But you're not, they're trying to, certainly not trying to um, uh, describe that conscious events in their mental lives. And that sort of thing works perfectly well for animals. The dog, you know, the dog uh, ran into the into the kitchen because it thought there was food and this sort of thing. But then there is another sort of use of this where we are trying to describe real events in our mental lives. If you're driving to work one day and you you suddenly remember that there was roadworks on the normal route and you, su you suddenly remember the fact that you changed direction. There it seems as an actual mental event happened, a thought, a belief that was kind of called up somewhere from memory and made a distinct um, uh, change to your behavior. So I, I got this idea that there are two distinct kind of forms of belief, desire, explanation. And I tried to trace this out just from a just from reflection on folk psychology rather than drawing on um, on empirical work very heavily. And I traced that out in a book that I call Mind and Supermind. The idea was the supermind is this conscious mind that sort of supervenes. I have some doubts about that title now, but anyway, it seemed clever at the time. Um, and now, after publishing that, I had already been aware that there was a lot of empirical work being done that kind of harmonized with this, but I kind of wanted to complete that project before getting too much into that, because I thought if I could make the story fly just on the basis of looking at our everyday practices of folk psychological explanation, it would be more plausible than if I just lent on this empirical crutch. But then as soon as I'd done that, I got started looking at the, the work and got in, uh, started collaborating with Jonathan Evans, who is one of the founders of dual process theory in psychology. And that, there, there is a very similar sort I, I of story. I should say it's, it's sort of p particularly famous by Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman and Tversky, right? They used it a lot? They, they certainly used it a lot, but I mean, in some ways, Jonathan's work was, um, um, I think he was right in at the start. I think he was, um, he, he worked with uh, Peter Wason and uh, he and David uh, Over published a book in uh, 1996 or late, nine, yeah, but I think um, on an, an early dual process theory, and he's continued to develop the theory. So yes, I mean, Kahneman certainly has used it a lot and produced that um, 2011 book. But I'd also recommend Jonathan's book, Thinking Twice, published around the same time, which is an excellent summary. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, Keith Stanovich, too, has been very important. And so there's a very similar picture, these kind of two levels of reasoning, where there's this automatic, unreflective processing that kind of, it's like, like autopilot that gets you around. And then there's this more reflective, conscious kind of reasoning which you can to some extent control. And if you're given a, a psychological experiment and you're told to, 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 to respond to, to the questions in a certain way, it, it seems that there are two kinds of responses people give. Sometimes they just give what seems like the intuitively plausible answer. And that seems to be a system one, they say automatic and un, reflective system. And sometimes though, they give a more considered answer that actually is more in line with what they were told to do. Uh, and that is more controlled and more responsive to the precise instructions they were given, and is usually the one that's correct given the um, uh, the, 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 the explicit task instructions. And so there seems to be two kinds of, of ways of engaging um, uh, with a problem. And this mapped quite nicely onto, um, onto what I've been doing. And I also thought that the way I'd presented this, which was that the conscious stuff was actually a kind of activity. It was, it was it was something we do, uh, like the sort of reasoning you might do on a piece of paper in doing a sum. You, it's actually a series of actions mm. rather than some other separate brain system. It was a system of activity, of engagement. Maybe you can do it in your head using mental imagery, but it was still a series of actions. And that seemed to be the, the, the crucial feature of this system too. And But I didn't think that the dual process people had actually kind of seen that. <laughs> and so I tried to use the picture that I developed from reflection on folk psychology to reinterpret 
the dual systems theory in this way. And I, I think, I still think that interpretation stands up because one thing that has happened in the course of um, uh, the development and the assessment of dual process theories is that they've had to back off from quite a lot of the more specific claims about the nature of these two systems. Um, you find in some early versions of this, there's lots of features ascribed to system one and lots of features ascribed to system two. And it's quite implausible that each of these kind of processes has all of that package and then you never get crossover ones. But I think seeing one as involving a, just a kind of activity, personal sort of activity, and the other as just being a brain process, uh, helps to get to the core of what's different between the two. And I, I still think that stands up. So. That's interesting. Were, were you <laughs> were you essentially sort of reinterpreting the work based on sort of introspection and analysis of your own? Based on philosophical analysis of folk psychology, really. Yeah, and thinking about um, work in philosophy of action, um, and thinking about the role of intention. So yes, I was I was I was doing the thing that we talked about at the beginning. I was trying to see how things fit together. Mm. And I mean, Jonathan once said to me a very interesting thing and he said that he thought maybe psychologists this was some years ago now he said that psychologists were doing too many experiments and maybe they should have a sort of a moratorium on experiments and just spend a few years just thinking about the experiments they'd already done and hmm. in a way that's what philosophers have been doing i suppose they've been trying to i mean they do get sucked into uh, you know fashions and trends as much as anyone but i like to think that I mean, philosophers are licensed to speculate in a way that perhaps scientists couldn't get away with. Um, you know, we, we, we're licensed to be experts in everything and nothing, as I said, you see. So we can, mm. um, you know, we don't, I, I, I think that's both the strength and the weakness of philosophy, that we can, we can uh, look at a bunch of empirical work and say, oh, what does that really, you know, I mean, maybe if you just pull back the focus a bit, you know, you can see this pattern here. And it's not very rigorous in the way that we're doing this. And it's relying on intuition and uh, you know, armchair uh, reflection. But it's, and of course, it shouldn't be taken as being uh, authoritative, but I think it's a contribution because we might just see something see a connection there that people who are much closer to the to the actual uh, uh coal face or whatever wouldn't see yes well we, we've sort of rather rather satisfyingly come full circle and rather naturally ended up so i feel like let's let's perhaps draw it to a close here we've we, we started with thinking about what philosophy is all about and talking about trying to understand how things hang together in the broadest sense uh, and we've we've closed with that thought but having explored lots of ideas on the way. So that's a, a very elegant and uh, <laughs> uh, way to close, I think. Thank you for that. So thank you for speaking to me. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's been a pleasure. It's been very fun. So that's all for this episode, folks. If you're enjoying the podcast, then don't forget to leave a nice review. See you next time.